be in it. So, um, who wants to introduce? Uh, what? Okay. Thank you. Hello, I'm Alan Hodge. I'm president of the White Pine Foundation, and together with my wife Elizabeth, we're the co-founders for the Northwest Liberty Academy. And of course, one of our strongest uh, uh, well items that we teach is the right to the ownership of private property. So it's not that that there are such is such a thing as private property rights. There is the right to ownership and control of private property. <laughs> And I think an example of that here is our next speaker, Wayne Hage, who is a member of what I think is one of the primary uh, uh, well, groups that have been persecuted lately, and that's ranchers. And so we have what we now could call bureaucratic tyranny afoot, especially in the West. And it has to do with the idea that the government itself, which is supposed to protect the right to ownership of private property, is now in the business of stealing it, including taking land, taking water from ranchers, and rustling their cattle. So with that, I think I just want to, we have a little, very little time, I want to turn the microphone over to Wayne Hage, who has for two generations now, uh, with his family, his father, his mother, and his stepmother, Hel Helen Chenoweth, who some of you may know, have been dear friends of ours, has been fighting the good fight through the judicial process against bureaucratic tyranny. Please welcome Wayne Hage. How much time do you want me to take here? Um, we have uh, dinner. We're cutting off at dinner at 5.50, so about 30, 30 minutes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Um, yes, as Ellen was saying, uh, my, my folks have, uh, they first started in this property rights fight, basically as soon as they bought Pine Creek Ranch in Central Nevada. What had happened is in, in 1978, we, we bought a ranch. Um, shortly thereafter, the United States government came in and decided to make a national park out of it. And they offered us about half of what we had just paid for the place. And we, we countered and said, what are you gonna pay for the, the water rights that we have out there on the rangeland and also uh, the range rights that we have out there on the rangeland. As soon as we brought those two things up, they no longer decided to, that they needed that national or that land for a national park. And uh, once they figured out that we knew we had rights out there, they went over to the eastern side of the state and they made the Great Basin National Park over there instead. But that started a, a great big long fight between us and the federal government. Um, Subsequently, over the years, the United States um, tried to defeat our water rights by filing over the top of them and making it impossible for us to use our water, both irrigation and stock water. And uh, progressing forward, finally culminating in 1991, the federal government came in at armed gunpoint, just like they did at Bundy Ranch. In 1991, we were the first people to have our cows taken at gunpoint from the United States, or by the BLM and the United States Forest Service. Actually, it was mainly the Forest Service in that instance. So, and if you go back, talking about the Bundy family, if you go back and look at the old photographs of the protests that were taking place on the theft of those cattle, the young kids in that, in those photographs, that was Ammon, Ryan, all the rest of the Bundys. They were there at that time. And to keep in mind, the Bundy family was there for everybody, everybody in the state of Nevada. When they were, when they had their cows stolen, the Bundy family was always there, always there, trying to stop it, trying to help. And uh, I have a great amount of respect for them. They've always been there for everybody. Anyway, uh, the one first thing I want to talk about, and I want to, and I'll tell you about what's going on in our case. Um, so I'm going to leave off at 1991, 
It finally culminated and we, we basically went to the United States Court of Federal Claims. We didn't argue with the government that they had a right to take the ranch. We just simply said, look, if you are gonna take it, you've gotta pay for it. And they don't like that. I guarantee you they don't like that. Um, but in deciding what we're doing here um, and whether what we're doing is right or wrong in our stance against the federal government, in our stance for property rights, we had to ask a question, are we doing what is the right thing? I was in Hillsdale College, I went to Hillsdale College, Michigan, um, in 19, well, a lot later than this, but anyway, I had a Lithuanian professor in a, in a world politics course, and he asked me, um, he said, we got into a discussion of Aristotle and revolutions, he said, who was the revolutionaries during the Revolutionary War, the American Revolution? I said, well, it was a... It was a colonist we rebelled against King and Parliament. And he looked at me and he said, you dumb Americans, you don't even understand your, your own history. Uh, I didn't know what was wrong with my answer, but anyway, I got about a, a half hour lecture because of that and I learned something very, very important that day. Anyway, he explained, he said, no, it was not, not the colonists who were the revolutionaries during the Revolutionary War. He said, who was taking the rights of Englishmen away from the colonists? Who was taxing them without representation? Who was quartering soldiers in their houses? The searches and seizures without a warrant? So on and so forth. He said it was finally the colonists, finally the colonists who stood up to, to protect their rights as Englishmen and say no more. What brought this about in the discussion of Aristotle was Aristotle says only a perverse revolution will lead to a perverse form of government and a correct revolution will lead to a correct form of government. And in studying what we have here in the United States, we have a correct form of government. But according, I misunderstood Aristotle into thinking that armed conflict always resulted in a perverse revolution. Well, in fact, it does not. It does if if the other side institutes it and you go along with it and they force it upon you. However, and Aristotle was correct because in our case, we took up arms in defense of our rights. We took up arms to protect our rights as Englishmen to prevent a perverse revolution from happening. And that is why we have a correct form of government today. So what are we doing in this fight against or fight for property rights every speaker today talking about what they're what they're defending what the organizations are doing we're defending our rights as americans and we have a duty to protect those rights and if we don't we are going to have a perverse form of government shoved down upon us so i commend every single one of you today and thank you so much for doing what you're doing and back to our case and I, I just wanted to share that with you because I learned so much that day. <laughs> and uh, I, I thank that Lithuanian professor. He used to teach communism, by the way. He went to school with Gorbachev. He used to talk about Gorbachev. And, and uh, he said they used to make Gorbachev dance for them because he came from peasant stock and he knew all the fun peasant dances. But, uh, quite an interesting guy. Um, so in 1991, we filed our case against the United States and we just simply said, look, if you're gonna take our land, then at least pay for it. And what the government had done is they made it absolutely impossible for us to run any cattle on that ranch without those cattle being in trespass or in violation of some bureaucrat rule in one way or the other. Um, they had done things, uh, and I don't want to go into all of it, but things as extreme as where they would license us on one side of a boundary. And then if a cow stepped over that boundary and it's a 21 mile boundary, then she would be trespassed and she would be impounded without any notice whatsoever. Now there was, there was over 20 trails 
and I think over 12 roads going through this 21 mile boundary that even the bureaucrats could not define for us. They could not tell us where that boundary was. But if a cow got on the other side of it, then for sure she was gonna be impounded and trespassed without her, trespassed and then impounded without notice. And by the way, when they did take those cattle, they went ahead and sold them and they pocketed the money. That's how they deal. There was absolutely no due process involved. It just happened. Well, anyway, um, our main argument on our stock waters that we have on the land that the government likes to call public land or forest service land or BLM land, we own those waters. Those are private property rights, okay? Those private property rights, those, the ownership of those water rights go clear back into the 1860s when our predecessors and in interests had appropriated that water. The government was saying that we need a permit in order to access and use that water. So that is the argument that we brought against the government. They said, we simply said they have taken that access to that water away from us by denying or canceling a permit or making the permit so burdensome that we could not use it anymore. So the question before the court then became is how can this permit affect a, a, a stock water right? The government's defense to that was to basically say, look, that permit is, is nothing but a simple permit. Um, it can be revoked without any, um, it can be revoked at any time. It can be granted at any time. Sorry, we're having trouble hearing you in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll try to speak up a little bit. And so, um, um, their, their defense is that this permit has absolutely no bearing on a stock water right because it can be revoked at any time. It never granted any rights and it can't take any rights away from you. And we are at the same time arguing that this water right is a privately owned uh, property right. It's a vested right and there's an importance to the word vested. That's the highest form of property that you can have. In other words, it's not dependent upon anything else to happen in the future for its enjoyment and use. It's a complete right. There's nothing more that can make it more completer. So the court had to ask the question to itself, is that water right a true vested property right or is it just a mere illusion or what the court called an illusory right? And if it's an illusory right, well then it might be dependent upon this permit in order to access and enjoy this property. But if it's a true vested right, then the government would be correct in saying that the permit cannot affect that water right whatsoever. And the court came to the conclusion that, yes, as a matter of fact, this property right, this vested water right is a complete right, and that permit cannot affect it. Well, what that did in a sense is that defeated our takings case against the government on our water, because our argument hinged that because be since we don't have this grazing permit, we can't go out and use our stock water rights. We cannot place our cattle on the, on the water sources, which the government is calling public land, and use that without that permit. Okay, and if they take that away, we don't have a taking. So we were kind of stuck. We were thinking, man, this is a really bad deal. Well, then we decided, okay, we're gonna have to press the issue a little bit more. So we decided to use our water, just like the Bundy's, use our water without their grazing permit because as the government said themselves that permit cannot grant or deny any part of that water right and since we own that and we have the right to access it we're going to use it without their permit knowing full well that the government would come after us in fact in the claims court we told the judge at that time we said look if we try to use this stock water right without their federal grazing permit, they're gonna come after us in a trespass action. And the judge said, well, that hasn't happened. In other words, that, that's not right. You can't bring that before the court. In other words, that you can't speculate what somebody might do. You don't have standing right now on that issue. And they were correct. The, the court was absolutely correct. So we put our cows back out. And subsequently in, in 2006, my, my father died and my stepmother died. And in 2007, 
the United States came after myself and my father's estate in a trespass action, saying that since we don't have a permit, federal grazing permit from the government, our cattle are in trespass, even though all we're trying to do is access and make them, uh, and beneficially use our water. We were just making an honest assertion of our water rights, and now we're getting trespassed for it. At that point in time, I went to, uh, or just right previously to that, I'd gone through a pro se law course and decided to defend myself uh, pro se in the courts. Uh, there's a gentleman here in this area, in the Boise area, Mark Pollock, who uh, became my attorney for my father's estate, and we teamed up and went against the federal government. As it turned out, we had uh, about three months worth of trial. Um, there was over 3,000 exhibits. I think the federal government had about 1,500 and we had about 1,500. And after 21 days of trial, which took in three months to get through that 21 days of trial, uh, something shocking did happen. Uh, the first thing that the, that the federal district court judge had said was that the United States had entered into an intentional, uh, had entered into an intentional conspiracy against our family. First, the United States Forest Service, and later joined by the BLM, a conspiracy to take our water rights and our forage rights away from us, and also found the government actors, the head of the Forest Service and the head of the BLM in those areas, in contempt of court and also sent them to the U.S. Attorney for prosecution of the conspiracy and then gave us an injunction against the federal government from interfering with our water rights and forage rights. At the same time, the judge had given an injunction against the federal government to force me to get a permit from the agencies or at least apply for the permit and force them to give it to me uh, so that we would uh, um, be able to operate. The judge had told us early on in the case, because I was arguing that we don't need this permit. If our water right is a true vested right, then we have the right to access and use that water without this permit. In other words, how can the permit be the access to this water? And the argument goes that, and, and I, I differ in our argument than, than other grazing cases. And the reason for that is the other grazing cases had lost and I was trying to figure out why did they lose? They shouldn't have lost. Well, in the previous grazing cases, ranchers were arguing that they have a water right. They know they have that. And then arguing for a separate forage right. The problem with that is they can't point to any law that gives them the separate forage right. Our case was different. We were just merely going back and looking at what the claims court judge had told us. He said, look, that forage is a component of, an essential component of the water right itself. In other words, the two cannot be separated from each other. In order to, to take the water right up and make beneficial use of that water, you had to first appropriate that forage along with it. In other words, a cow cannot survive on water alone. She has to have forage also. So the forage and the water are inseparable. Also another essential component is access. If you don't have access to it, any property, if you don't have access to that chair right there, well then you don't, you can't own it. You might say you do, but you can't exercise your rights to that property. So we were arguing that the forage is an essential component of the water right. It cannot be separated. And as such, we have a right to utilize whatever forage has been appropriated for the use of that stock water. And that's quantified in Nevada law anyway, it's quantified. In other words, if our stock water right on a well is, or a spring is for a hundred headed cows for a certain length of time, whether it be eight months, nine months, 12 months out of the year, then that's how much forage goes along with that water right. So the judge told us early on, he said, look, I'm not going to go there. He said, I, he said, I agree with you constitutionally, but we're dealing with the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit would not go there. So what he chose instead was to keep us under the permit system, but he also retained jurisdiction of the case like a blessing decree for the rest of his life so that if anything ever happened, we could go directly into court in front of him and, uh, 
and be able to um, bring our grievance directly to the court. And if he needed to jerk up the government, he could do that. So it was a it was a pretty good victory. Incidentally, that was the rule of the court during the Bundy Ranch deal. That was the rule of the court. In fact, the judge had ruled that we did own the forge at least within half a mile within our water rights. That was overturned. But during the Bundy Ranch time, that was the rule of law at the time. Every cow out there that Bundy had within half a mile could not be in trespass by any way, shape, or form. Interesting. The government doesn't like that they don't like cases and they ignore cases that are not on their side. I've seen that many, many times. I'll just simply ignore them. However, this is interesting. We go up to the Ninth Circuit, and what the government argued was that, and literally, this is no joke, their argument was. We, the government, we always win. Therefore, the judge must have been biased against us. That was literally their argument before the Ninth Circuit. And it was such a stupid argument, in my opinion, that we never addressed that. We addressed other things that were on appeal. We never really addressed that. I mean, we kind of hit on a little bit, but not, we didn't give it much time. Because in order to argue bias, if the court rules are simple, in order to argue bias against a judge, you have to do that before the judge makes uh, his first ruling. Well, we had several actually published decisions, published rulings out of this same judge after several years. This court case has been going on for quite a few years. And only at the very end, when they were unsatisfied with the decision that the court made, then they hollered bias. Uh, according to the court rules, they're supposed to do that a long time before. So we figured it was a no brainer, we're going to win on that. We go to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit said, well, that judge was biased. He had to have been biased, so they threw out everything that that judge had ruled on and said, Hage must be a trespasser, stripped off the half mile limitation on the, on the distance from water that the previous court had put on, that the trial court had put on, and basically said any cow that they can prove is in trespass out there, I have to pay a trespass fee for. The case was remanded to the district court under a new judge, and that judge was Navarro. A lot of you probably recognize that name. <laughs> so, anyway, so what Judge Navarro had done is she took all the allegations and even the ones that were not even allowed, the government tried to amend their complaint to, to throw in a bunch more allegations for some sub subsequent years. Those were not allowed in court, so Navarro, on a motion hearing, for, actually it was a status conference. We showed up for a status conference and in that status conference, she made her ruling at that time without any hearing or us allowing, being able to address the issue. She, uh, she ruled a $580,000 judgment against me, basically looked at how many cows I owned during the time period and said, all those cows must be in trespass. And I was a repeated willful trespasser and then used the government rate of repeated willful trespass, and I got a $580,000 judgment against me. So, of course, I appealed. Now we're headed back up to the Ninth Circuit a second time. So we get back up before the Ninth Circuit, and I decided to argue my case uh, by myself, or myself in front of the Ninth Circuit, and my, uh, the estate attorney, Mr. Pollock, he's arguing for the estate. I decided to go first since it was mainly my neck on the line at that time. What was interesting about the Ninth Circuit the second time we got there is we had an entirely brand new panel of judges. And it, it, it was just, it was different. Usually the Ninth Circuit was hostile to us. I mean, super hostile when we walked into the courtroom and this time they were not. And so the, one of the first questions that was asked of me while I was trying to present my side of the case they said, why do you think you're not a willful trespasser? Because there is a big difference between non-willful and willful and repeated willful. The rates change dramatically on what you're charged. Well, the, since Navarro had ruled that I was a willful trespasser in my briefs, I said, no, I'm a non-willful trespasser. I'm just making an honest assertion of our property rights. There's only one way to use them. That's by taking a cow to the water. And let me back up here because when the when the previous Ninth Circuit panel had made their ruling, 
what they had ruled is they knew they could not deny us access to that water. They were smart there. They knew they could not deny access to the water. So they pulled up an old case out of, out of Death Valley, California, a rancher down there by the name of Hunter, Hunter versus United States. And they, in that case, uh, Hunter had established a ranch in Death Valley, California, and it was one of the harshest climates that we have in North America here. And in that case, uh, they made the national park, and after they made the national park, they decided they didn't like bovine anymore. They didn't want to see cows running around their pretty little park. So they said, no more cows in the park. Hunter said, wait a minute, I have water rights down here. He took up all the water sources in that area of that park. And those were water rights for his cattle. And he said, wait a minute, I own the forage that goes along with that water. You can't, the court recognized that he owned the water. The question was on the forage. And so what that court basically said was, you own the water, the government owns the forage. You have to get a permit to use the forage. And since they don't want to give you a permit, they don't have to give you a permit. So therefore, if you want to use your water, then you have to transport your water out of that park. Take it to your private ground somewhere. Through the old 1866 uh, Ditch Act. <clears throat> We're familiar with RS 20, uh, 2477 type right of ways. That's where that comes from, is the 1866 Act. So that's what they did to us. They could not deny us access, so they just used the Hunter case and said, okay, you can remove your water off the land. Well, in the meantime, when they had done this, I went, uh, and after we got done with Navarro, uh, after Navarro had made her ruling, the government asked Navarro, uh, Navarro if they still had to give me a permit, and Navarro said, no, um, that part of the case has been overturned. You don't, you're not forced to give Mr. Hage a permit anymore. And they said, good, because we're not gonna. <laughs> and, and Navarro even, I have to give credit to uh, Judge Navarro on this one. Um, she even kind of looked at them like, hey, you guys, like, you better reconsider that. Um, at least afford me the same opportunity to apply for a permit as anybody else would, is what she warned them on. And they decided, no, they're just simply not gonna give me a permit because they want us gone. So I had gone down to the local Forest Service and local BLM agencies, and I asked them if they were gonna allow me to transport that water off the land through the 1866 law, like the Ninth Circuit had said. I said, no. I said, now wait a minute, the Ninth Circuit just ruled that I have a right under the 1866 law to ditch pipe and canal this water off the land. And of course, a lot of it's in wilderness areas. Most of it, 80% of this water is in wilderness areas. But our rights predate the wilderness, see? The grandfather did. So I said, are you gonna, you're saying you're not gonna allow me that. I said, you can't do that. You have to, if you want to right away, you have to apply under FLIPMA. You have to go through the NEPA process and all this brand new law type stuff. And I said, well, wait a minute. The, our rights exist back to 1866. The law that controls is the 1866 law, and that is the law that the Ninth Circuit said that I have the right to take that water off the land with. I said, you can't do it, we won't allow you. And I asked them this because I, and I asked them, I said, look, let's, let's solve this issue right now because I don't want you to come in and, and arrest me or shoot me, throw me in jail, whatever you're gonna do, you do it to other people. So let's just solve this problem right now. Tell me if you're not gonna allow me. And they said, no, you can't. So three times, I got them three times to say, no, you cannot take that water off the land. So now we're back before the Ninth Circuit. We got this different panel of judges and they asked me, why are you not a willful trespasser? I said, well, that's the only way we can use this water is by taking a cow to the water. That's how it was appropriated. That's how it's been used for 160 years. That was local law and custom that was recognized. They said, no, we ruled previously, and I don't think these three judges liked the previous ruling, but they had, they were stuck with it. And they said, we ruled previously that you have the right to take that water off the land through the 1866 law. And I said, yes, your honors. But I asked the government if they're gonna allow me to do that. And they said, no, holy cow. I mean, to tell you what, them judges about come out of their seats. They said, what? I said, after you made your ruling, I went to the agencies to, cause I didn't want them to come beat me up said, are you gonna allow me to take that water off the land? And they said, no. And those judges got mad. Oh, they got mad. 
And they said, wait a minute, the law has commands on them also. They said, you might think that, but when you go back to Tonopah, Nevada, that's not how it operates. You're not the judge, they are. You know, they're the ones with the guns. Oh, they were mad. So when the, when the government attorney got on, they asked the government attorney, are you gonna allow them to take that water off the land? And the government attorney waffled around and waffled around and finally the Alaskan judge, he says, I take that as a no. And then another judge there invited me to bring in an injunction against the United States to prevent them from interfering with us while we take that water off the land. And the Alaskan judge, he corrected them, corrected the government, and he said that right away already exists. The government was, <laughs> they were distraught. They said, wait a minute, what about our wilderness area? You know? Because 80% of these are in the wilderness area. Now, the interesting thing about this whole deal, the reason I bring this up, is we've had many decisions out of the courts. And a lot of the decisions that we thought were against us are actually now working in our favor. Even in that Ninth Circuit um, argument, the government attorney finally had to start arguing our case for us. She finally had to go to the, the court and say, wait a minute, Your Honor, she said, the, the water and the forage is so intimately connected that you cannot separate the two. <laughs> And if they take their water off the land, we won't be able to manage the land like we want to. That's how interesting it's getting. Well, the right of ways that we have that were recognized by that court, I haven't decided exactly where they're all gonna go yet, but we get a spider web this wilderness area and down all these canyons where all the best feed is with our pipelines and ditches and canals. So, if we, and we get to fence it and we own the forage within our right-of-ways. By the time we're done putting all this, all these right-of-ways in and removing all this water off the land, it'll be absolutely worthless, absolutely worthless for the government. The only choice they have now is to argue our case for us and say, wait a minute, the water and the forage is intimately connected. It cannot be separated and thus, we would have that forage. So anyway, I think I'm done here, but I wanted to tell you, don't give up. We've had many ups and downs, many, many ups and downs. But if you stick with what is right and what is true and what is lawful, and you hold on long enough, their lies will bite them in the butt. And we are in a better position now than we ever have been. Way better position. Because now if they don't give us a permit, and here's the other thing, we own about 30,000 head of livestock worth of water rights. They want to give us a permit. The last time they tried to give us a permit was for about 2,000 head of cows. So now if they don't give us a permit for the full entire amount of water rights that we own, then they're gonna to have to pay compensation for that. Not that they own, they won't get ownership of the water. They'll just have to pay for us not taking it off the land. So a lot of things have changed. In my opinion, ranches are in a way better position now than they ever have been because we're in the driver's force and we're no longer subject to that permit. And if the government wants to manage the land for the wild horse or the sage grouse or whatever they want to, and they want to take a cow off that land, they're going to have to pay or the rancher will just be able to say, hey, I'm going to go home with my water and nothing else is going to have water. So it's an interesting, interesting development. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we get a uh, gentleman here had a question. Yeah, I did have a question. Uh, one, I, I should, I'd like to uh, introduce a lot of the effort and yep. uh, all the effort that you've done with uh, uh, in this battle. Two questions is, uh, one, maybe on a personal note, do you have children? Yes, I've got three. And uh, to my understanding, have you, uh, uh, since your earliest memories, have you ever uh, enjoyed any part of your life uh, without the uh, federal government uh, looming over your grandma's uh, grandfather's property and uh, causing uh, uh, these kinds of actions and what it rights? And I have rights. 
you ever remember a time in the uh, lifetime that, that no that i mean my there? my whole life we were three i was three years old when we bought that ranch 1978 so now how old i am but uh but no i don't remember a time now do i enjoy my life every minute of it sure I, and I, I, in I, other I, words for me that, that property is is a great piece of property love it enjoy it it's wonderful you guys ought to come down and see it but that's not what drives me i'll tell you my god is tougher than they are and that's what i live for so that's just that's just very well sir you're an inspiration to us all because uh we do have our battles and uh as far as I'm concerned, uh, you've gone, gone above and beyond. That's right. I think, uh, I think next year, next year we got to do this the whole weekend, huh? There's just no way we could do 17 speakers all in one day, even in a 12.